It is not just one of the best rivalries in college football. It's currently engulfed in possibly the best division race in college football. It's USC and UCLA uh, inside that Pac-12 South where chaos is ensuing from week to week, and you got to keep up with the way the scenarios could play out. Uh, we bring in Evan Budrovich of Conquest Chronicles, of course, to break down this one. Evan, I just realized it before I sat down that I'm donning the powder blue. Now, I would never in any way try to offend any of my guests, but it just kind of happened this way. So I need you to tell me why this one's so special. USC, UCLA, even as a guy from the Midwest, I used to look forward to this game along with the Ohio State, Michigan's, Alabama, Auburn to the world, uh, even though it was so far away and I was usually looking at 20 inches of snow versus <laughs> the 72 degrees outside at the Rose Bowl or the L.A. Coliseum, but it, it is special. Yeah, I think it just starts with the proximity, uh, just how close these two schools are, separated by one freeway down the road, you know, 10, 15 miles. Uh, the, the student bodies are different because you have the private school at USC where there's a little more, uh, as a student myself, I can say, there's a little more expectation of success and some arrogance that comes alongside that. I think UCLA, they're hardworking as well, but it, it's interesting because both, both schools are very competitive in every sport, and football is, is obviously the biggest one, so there's that to it. I think there's just the history of UCLA now winning the last couple games, so they've had recent success, the last two, and USC being so dominant in the early 2000s. The big thing with this rivalry, though, is just, as you mentioned, how close this race is and that both teams need the win to, to keep their chances alive. So it, it makes it even more interesting from a fan's perspective. You know, I mentioned some of the great rivalries in college football, and there have been at times that Michigan's dominated Ohio State or Alabama's dominated Auburn a number of times. And, and for a long time there, USC winning 12 out of 13. Did that kind of put a damper on the rivalry? Did it lose a little bit of luster until... Jim Moore came on board? No, absolutely, and I think you're spot on there. In that 10- to 15-year gap, it, it was kind of a foregone conclusion who was going to win that game, and fans were still excited to, to beat UCLA and have some of the, the pregame traditions, but I, I think it kind of lost its luster, like you mentioned, and then just in the recent two to three years with Coach Mora coming in and really changing the, the philosophy of that program and Brett Hundley making big plays for them, it, it really has... UCLA is starting to say now that they kind of run the town, and <laughs> as much as I'd try to disagree with that, it's tough to say because they've, they've made the Pac-12 championship a couple years ago. They've won a lot of big games, so they're starting to look like a team that's almost more consistent than USC, and that's strange to think given the history. But in, in these last two to three years, it, it's shifted a little bit, and this game, especially with Sark being it's his first game at USC, it, it'll be a huge statement for both teams. Based on the location of this game, it would make sense that there would be star power in this game, and there has been in the past, but not necessarily on the UCLA side in the, in the uh, recent past. But this season, we've got star power all over the place, and we've got one in particular who's got a bit of a side story in Josh Shaw coming back uh, to USC this week. Yeah, it's, it's scary because we, we heard Josh Shaw on the news for all the wrong reasons you know, 10, 12 weeks ago. Now he comes back to the team after... Uh, the Los Angeles Police Department investigated, and they didn't press any charges or find anything against him. So he was back on the practice field on Wednesday, and it, as quickly as that, he was working out in the, at the beach, and they said he was doing some practice stuff outside of USC, and he comes right back into practice on Wednesday, and, and he looks pretty sharp. He did the things he needed to do, and Sark is now saying that, assuming he doesn't get hurt in the, in the next couple of days of walkthroughs, he's going to play, and that's huge. He said he was a captain. He's not going to be anymore, but he was at one point. He was a starter, a guy with draft potential in the first couple rounds, so he's an impact player, and, and to have him back could be really crucial for USC's defense. Evan, we mentioned the recent halt to USC dominance in this series. It uh, came at, at the time that uh, Red Huntley hit campus along with Jim Mora. Huntley uh, has accounted for five touchdowns in two games with no interceptions against USC. Uh, just your thoughts about uh, what USC needs to do on the defensive side of the ball with uh, J.R. Tabai, defensive end, back in the lineup uh, trying to defend Huntley and company. Well, it's funny. There was a point there. USC was not getting pressure on opposing quarterbacks. So they have the least – they're not the lowest, but they're in the bottom three in the Pac-12 in terms of total sacks against the quarterback. So they're not doing a great job of getting pressure on any opposing quarterback, and Hunley is so elusive in the pocket. His running game last year essentially won the Bruins that game, his ability to, to make things happen when it broke down. or I know he rushed for over 100 yards, so he made a lot of plays with his feet, and, and this year that, that's the M.O. Stop Brett Hunley. Don't let him make the big play, because if, if he beats you with the legs, 
it, it'll really speak to a lack of coaching because this, is, this would be three years now that you, you kind of knew what was coming and you just didn't stop it. And UCLA also can uh, go to the ground game as well. Uh, Paul Perkins, the second leading rusher in the uh, Pac-12, but your, your comfort level defending the run. It's actually been very good this year. That's the one thing where USC has stepped up in the run game. They're undermanned. They're, they're slightly oversized. But this USC defensive line is, is aggressive, and I think that helps them in the run game. Leonard Williams being a huge anchor, of course, the, the big All-American up the middle. They're, they're doing a good job stopping the run, and they're, they're, one of, they're actually the best team in the Pac-12 at doing it. So that's the area that USC can really hold their hat on and try to dominate the game in that department. Now, what UCLA does is they run outside the tackles. They like to do a lot of stretch plays, a lot of counters and pulls. So they're not going to pound it up the middle traditionally. So USC is going to be tested a little bit in that regard. But if they can hold up, it will certainly play in their favor. Don't know if many college football observers would have guessed that uh, Cody Kessler's touchdown to pick ratio right now would be 29 to 3. Uh, it, 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 it's really amazing. And, and if you talk about the top five quarterbacks in college football, he would rarely be named. But if we're just talking about production, Cody Kessler has had an amazing season. What differences have you seen in Kessler this year versus maybe at the end of 2013? I, I think it's trust, and, and it, it sounds simple, but an ability to distribute the ball out to a variety of guys. It's, it's not just the Marquise Lees of the past or the Robert Woods making all the plays. There, there's a multitude of options, and it, it obviously it starts with Nelson Aguilar, a, a proven guy who's probably going to be an All-American this year, putting up great numbers the last couple of weeks. Uh, Juju Smith, who's a young freshman, he's doing some, some positive things. A couple of the receivers like Darius Rogers, George Farmer, some older guys who have been around for a while. But the thing is, though, they're making catches. So it's not just one guy getting 10 catches and somebody else getting one or two. There's a balance to the offense, and, and that's allowed Kessler a chance to you know, matriculate the ball down the field when he needs to. The interceptions are incredible. Three just this season, as you mentioned. That's more because he's a smart player and – He'll sometimes not take the big risk and just throw the ball out of bounds or maybe just run for two yards. So Kessler is efficient that way, so he doesn't make the mistake. And with the touchdown passes, it's been interesting because you look at some of the big games. Uh, they beat Colorado, Washington State, and Fresno. He, he accumulated over 12 touchdowns in those three games. So he was really putting together great numbers in those three. And there's been concern, and I'll, I'll be honest with you here, Mark, outside of those three, there's actually 14 that I think about it, but Outside of those three big games, it's only been maybe one or two touchdowns a game from Cody against the ranked teams or against the more competitive opponents. So this is going to be a huge test for Kessler because he's going to have to try to win a game if UCLA gets to an early lead or if they run the ball with Hundley. So there has to be a way for him to make those big plays in the passing game. This is why we bring you on, Evan. I see the touchdown to pick ratio overall. You break it down and let us know the distribution there and uh, Kessler needing to perform a little bit better against the better competition. Buck Allen's been amazing. I believe that he has performed against just about everyone. He leads the conference in rushing. Uh, I, I find it interesting when I see recruiting classes come in, and you'll see three, four, five running backs or skill position players, or really any position come in with, with similar rankings, and then one guy separates himself, and that's been the case with Buck Allen. Uh, your thoughts about what makes him a special back? Well, it's the combination of things. He can catch the ball out of the backfield, and he, he makes great plays as a receiver. Also, when he runs the ball, he's a physical specimen. He's, he's a big kid. Like, just walking around campus seeing him, he, he dominates the, the campus scene, so to speak. But Buck Allen's is a strong tailback who enjoys taking a big workload. He, he didn't play a lot the last couple of years, and he just came onto the scene in the middle of last season. So he's relatively fresh, and I, and I think that really helps a guy like Buck who takes a lot of pounding. He gets the football a lot. So... That, that's the key. you got to have a guy who can get 25 carries a game and not get overwhelmed from it. And, and just in terms of running the ball, Buck Allen, he takes contact and he pushes forward, so he's always going to get more yards after contact. He does a good job of following his blockers, and it sure helps to have two six foot five, six nine guys who are just gigantic on that right side of the line. But he does a good job following his blockers. And I, I think what's, what's sneaky about Buck is he actually does a great job of reading his blockers. So if, let's say, an offensive lineman's pulling and they're kind of leaning him towards the left, he'll let that play carry out, and he's patient. So he'll let that block finish, and then he'll follow it. So th those combination of factors make Buck Allen an, an, elusive, an elusive running back. Evan, I make this comment, I believe, every time I've gotten you on. But when I watch USC play, I see elite talent and athleticism and star power, uh, one or two guys in almost every unit. Uh, comparable to the best teams in college football. 
right. when you put it all together with the, the scholarship reductions, the limitations in depth, it's, it's still a really good football team, but not quite where we expect USC to be. Uh, this season could turn out to be a, still a really, really special season with a Pac-12 championship right in line, uh, a, an 11-3 and kind of top 10 team, or, you know, you've got some difficult assignments with UCLA in a bowl game, so it could be four or five losses. So uh, just, just your thoughts about uh, where USC stands, and in particular, we, we mentioned this before we came on, Losing leads, like I had the Cal game on, 31-2, to before I know it, Cal setting up for an onside kick to possibly pull out a miracle. Uh, you lose the game against Arizona State after having uh, kind of a comfortable situation in the last five minutes. Same thing at Arizona, and you held on for the victory. So is there any correlation between the lack of scholarships and, and possibly what we see late in games in this team kind of wearing down? Yeah, this has been the discussion of the year, just from the beat writers and the fans who've been watching. USC, the best team right now in first quarter point differential. So it's, it's 129 to 22 right now. So when, when USC comes out of the gates, they're hot, they play well. And actually on the road, I, I couldn't believe this, they're outscoring their opponents by nine points in the first quarter on the road. So not even at home where they're even more dominant. On the road, they do pretty well in the first. But as you mentioned, yeah, the fourth quarter, they're being outscored this year in, in the fourth quarter. But to, to your point... It's been very frustrating uh, seeing the talent that this team has for three quarters and then in the fourth, whether it's a lack of discipline or in the ASU game, just not being in the right position and, and teams taking the ball down the field very easily. And, and that's been the thing with this whole conference, to be honest. Uh, I was just looking at the stats this week. Over 75% of games have, have come down to one possession in the last three weeks, which is incredible. I mean, almost every game now is, is a close football game and they're all grind-out victories. So in USC's case where... Uh, they're playing less than 50 scholarship guys a game. That, that's just the, the fact of the situation, and you can't really avoid that because of the scholarship reductions and some of the injuries. They're undermanned as it is, and as this unit continues to pump out more reps early in the game, and let's face it, they're on the field more in the second half because they're winning, and the other team gets the ball back, and they're pushing it, so then USC's defense gets challenged a little bit, and the results have been a little scary sometimes. And it, Not to say that you don't trust the defense, but it really comes down to coaching then to manage the playing time, to manage when you blitz, when you don't, and that in, in turn puts your defense ready for the fourth quarter when these teams are going to start flinging it in the passing game. Evan, we could sit here for the next half hour and carve through all these scenarios, but basically it comes down to this, USC 6-2, and two. Uh, UCLA, Arizona State, and Arizona all at 5-2. and two. They've kind of beat up each other, so we would have to go scenario by scenario, but USC wins this game, they're in the clubhouse, they're waiting, and Arizona State lost for UCLA. They may actually have a tougher path because they not only have to defeat USC, but then they've got a decent Stanford team waiting in, in, in Week 12. So what would it mean for USC to win this division championship in regards to getting back to the elite of college football? Absolutely. The, the must-win game this weekend, of course, and then it's kind of out of their hands. But... USC hasn't won a Pac-12 South championship, and they had one that was not counted because of that one year where they had the illegitimate players, but so that they had a he, somewhat of a championship, and now they're looking for that first one, and UCLA's won it, Arizona State's won it, those are the two top dogs right now, and if USC wants to call themselves a legitimate top 15 program every year that Coach Sark says he does, then you have to win those championships in the division, so whether it's through recruiting, whether it's through winning those big games, you have to do it, and the fans here expect it. So beating UCLA is the first step in that. And, of course, if ASU wins out, you look back on that Hail Mary and say, what could have been? But other than that, I think winning the big game against a team like UCLA says, okay, this team is, is serious, they're legitimate, and they're back in that constant discussion with the likes of Oregon and Stanford to be a Pac-12 finalist. You reference uh, one of the oddest scenes I remember seeing. It was when UCLA lost that 50 to nothing game with Matt Barkley at the helm for USC, and they come off the field and, and are told that they've won the South <laughs> Division Championship. All right, Evan Budrovich of Conquest Chronicles joins us to knock down USC and UCLA. We appreciate the time, Evan. Always, Mark. Thank you.